Welcome to Noble Warrior. My name is CK Lin. This is a place where entrepreneurs talk about what it takes to create and scale purpose-driven organizations. We're going to talk about mindset. We're going to talk about mental models. We're going to talk about actionable tactics such that you can go out and create and scale your purpose-driven organization. My next guest was in charge of strategic alignment and continuous excellence for Nestle. He helps organizations build AI capabilities. He is deeply passionate about unlocking human creativity from the smallest scale to the largest scale. Please welcome Eric Hodner. Welcome, Eric. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, CK. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So one of the things that you share with me is that you love cooking, especially <laughs> you love cooking with fresh ingredients. Why don't we start there? What is your favorite? Yes. So I love cooking. I, I guess I love cooking because I'm both French and Vietnamese. That's my that's my origin. So I love to cook about Vietnamese food. I learned cooking Vietnamese food with my grandmother when I was a kid. Actually, I was watching her cooking every time we'd go back from school. I would sit down in the kitchen and do my homeworks. And my grandmother would like, do this wonderful Vietnamese food. And I'm French also, so I'm origin from Paris. So I love French cooking. The favorite recipe that I love to cook would be actually in French, it's called cheveux d'ange. It's hair. How is it called? Angel. And your hair. So it's a Vietnamese uh, recipe. So you steam basically those very light and thin noodles. So you steam that. And then on the other side, you prepare prepare your, your beef, your, your, your beef with your peanuts. You grind the peanuts and your beef. And you, you know, take this out in a wok, add some sprouts on it, and then prepare your nookmam sauce. And the nookmam is like a fish sauce. And everyone has this own recipe. There's like this... There's the basic ingredients, but it's all about uh, how you taste it and, uh, and make it your, your own. So let me ask you this. What about it makes you feel so good that that's your favorite recipe? I love to do that actually when I have dinner uh, with friends uh, and family. And the reason why I love this one is because you need to eat with your hands. And mm. what's so good about that is about sharing. So you put this at the center at the table and you, I love to do this like with first time people we meet because mm -hmm. you just open all the eating with a fork and a knife disappear. And the fact that you have to share with your hands creates that much more you know, bonding and, uh, mm -hmm. and the relationship of uh, you know, trust. So I guess that's I the reason why this one. I, I love that. It's, it's, it, you are a collaborator in all aspects of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we don't know each other very long. One of the things that touched me immediately is your desire to collaborate, your openness. I mean, that's part of who you are, right? So when you think about collaboration, one of the uh, hack is you break bread with someone. That's a, a way to get right to the source of relatedness, intimacy almost, right? Yeah. So... When you establish relationship with someone, is there any specific favorite methods to cultivate a relationship with someone from your point of view? I guess when you first meet someone, the things I like to do is really is get to know that person. So really being genuinely interested about this person. That's one of the foundation for me of, uh, of everything. And from there, you can build a, a, a real, a genuine relationship, which is not necessarily a business relationship. And to your point, I like the idea of breaking the bread. This is definitely that. That's why so food is so important. We have so many different tastes. Every human has a very specific taste, and this is unique. And if you look at personal situation, that's why we can go in very unique tastes. But at the same time, the fact that we eat together is the first part of creating a, a relationship of, of trust. So that's why I think food is so centered in our human relationship. As someone who views food as fuel to me food is food right but i, I do want to learn i i am curious i i do have the desire to learn right so 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 teach me right so someone who is really passionate who is a aficionado around food to someone who view food as just fuel what are some of the ways that i can do to enrich my life with you know to understand food better 
Yeah, it does. Actually, it's a good, a good question. I'm in no means, in no way, a food expert. I'm no chef. Just, you know, food is just part of my life. I, I work in the food industry for a while. I'm still connected to it. But I guess when it comes to food from a personal experience, I guess there's, there's cultural aspects of it. So I guess it's easier to talk about love of food when you're French. Because ah. it's part of your birthright. Ah, uh, when you grow up in France with amazing products, when you summer vacation is about taking an apéro and then taking your kids for lunch, and then you eat in you know, in a family setting, and you may spend with friends on family two three hours just sitting and eating and discussing. Okay, um, so everything is centered around the food that is on the table and how well it's been prepared, um, how good the products are. Uh, the start for everyone who's looking at food as a fuel is to look at so the, look at, at the raw products like, like tomato as itself is just to understand and try to get a good tomato from a farmer's market versus the one you're going to have in a grocery store. And, and just eating that tomato is about, it's all about picking the right ingredients. And you can just cut that tomato, put a bit of olive oil, a good one, especially from Spain or Italy, a little bit of good salt, and then just eat that. And not with the idea that uh, you need to fuel, but with the idea to say, how will this tomato taste like? And you will see that the appreciation of food really start with appreciating single ingredients and in product as they should be and not those ingredients that are being functionally cultivated and harvested with not a lot of taste, not a lot of, of flavors that you have to mix with um, other enhancer to, create, to actually create something else that is more acceptable to your palate. So I, I think for some people may be thinking, this is a strange question. What am I asking specifically around dishes and, and teach me about taste when we want to talk about sustainable food in a broader system with AI and so forth. But the way mm -hmm. I think about it is having this relationship, this emotional relationship with the food that we eat is the atomic unit of anything that we want to talk about. If I just view food as fuel, let's say, then I wouldn't care what I put into my system so much. But if I actually do have an emotional relationship with the taste with the sophistication, with the people that I eat with, then all of a sudden I'll care much more about the cradle to grave, so, so to speak, about the whole ecosystem because I care so much about this atomic unit. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting what you're saying because it's so true and applicable in my experience when there's no atomic connection to what you want to do, how difficult it's actually to get engaged. And to you know to really be good and, and performance at what you're doing, but yeah, absolutely I agree with your approach. So the way I think about sustainable food, was there a singular moment where you start to say to yourself, "Oh, I really care about this. I wanted to do more about it around innovation. I want to educate people about it. I want to use artificial intelligence, these bigger tools, to have bigger impact." On this thinking back, was there a moment where a light switch got turned on? This is something I want to dedicate my effort, my life, my career in focusing. That's a good question. I've been working for a long time for a big company. Nestle is the biggest food corporation in the world. And what is interesting is that I left the company like two years ago, and this was this moment in my life where I was about either to continue with another mission with the company. The company was moving the headquarters from Los Angeles, and I was offered a position in Seattle at the time. And that was this moment in time when I was wondering, shall I just continue there? And Nestle was a fantastic, phenomenal school. It's the biggest real life business school uh, because you get to work on so many project with uh, with such impact but at the same time to your point i was trying to align with what i do really care about food but also uh, about innovation and how innovation and technology actually should serve sustainable purpose so that's the reason why i left uh, nestle and said okay i'm gonna try how do i bring all the things i've learned in working with this company and to start something else 
So that was the moment uh, for me of switch. And I started this something else, and that's, that's so interesting because we have this tendency to think that you have um, control on your life, that you are setting plans and you stick to your plans. But I have to be honest with myself, it's not like that. It's, it's, it's always been a mix of, I have kind of an idea of what I want to do, but I'm again, taking turns here and left and right, and then sticking me to other places. And then I have to kind of rationalize. And you have to rationalize this when you have to present yourself as a person, when you present your profile on LinkedIn, et cetera, which is a difficult work to do. But in reality, I've been more a person that's taking different turns of direction, really based on passions and where in a given moment in my life, uh, I can do what I have and, and what I see as a potential. All to say, I mentioned that is when I, I left Nestle was to start a food company and uh, we're still working on that. And the whole idea is how do we create a meal delivery system of personalized nutritional meals so that are good for your health, that is sustainably sourced using regenerative agriculture, and that can be delivered at your house by using recyclable, reusable packaging. So how do you create a circular economy that people can afford? And so that was the main idea. And one of the key components of this, one of the key enabler is actually leveraging AI, artificial intelligence, because I can help you understand your consumer behavior in terms of food. So you imagine like the Spotify of food, that's, that's the idea on one end. And the, the more you try something, the more you can learn on one end. So we can really personalize about your lifestyle, about your activity and everything. So we can really tie something that is nutritional balance for you on one end. And then you use AI on the other end for managing supply and demand. So how do you reduce waste? so that you do the most optimized food order of raw products and because you can start anticipating most likely how much and what kind of product people would, would eat. So that was the, the purpose of this, but I wasn't in the field of AI at the time. So I had to actually really understand, even if I was working back on Nestle with some parts of AI, so I say, how do we how do I get competencies and experiences in that field? So that's where the first step I studied this, this company, Kinestry, and really trying to have a team that has expertise in AI and try to understand how we innovate with, with that tool. Um, so that was kind of a, a first step in, in the process. So the AI workshop came out of your own journey of understanding artificial intelligence as a tool to help you build this Fooditude business yes. that you're creating. I see. That's really smart. Uh, I want to take a step back for a moment. And because it, it, what you said about life is in a straight line, I have a plan and I go from point A to point B and let's see what happens at point B. It's never so simple like that. Usually it's a fractal of choices you got to make yeah. a, 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 in the middle of chaos, inner and outer chaos, right? So, so the question I have for you would be, there's a million other things that you could be doing including staying at Nestle, right? You decided to come out of it, food to but a million other things that you could be doing. Could you walk us back on maybe some mental models or processes that you did as a way to help you make the best decisions possible holistically for you, for your family, for your community, everyone that depends on you? Any, any specific mental models that you use as a way to help you make that decision? I, so one of the things I'm doing a lot is talking to a lot of different people and usually talking to people that are like 10, 15 and 20 years ahead of me in terms of the experience. That's something I've been doing a lot and actually, you know, testing some of those ideas about my life with these people and see how they respond to that and what were their experience. There's no check and balances tools that um, would work. I've done this so many times at the beginning, like, okay, it was the... Was the plus, was the manners. It's like, yeah, I have a family, three kids. We moved from, you know, Europe to here. And it was like, it's already, already a, a big, a big shift in, in terms of uh, life change. So then when you move away from the security of a very large firm, you need to do a calculated risk definitely, which is a very different situation where if I were 20 years younger, you need to take into consideration how much can you risk on one end. But yeah, it's not really mental model. Tactics that I've been using a lot is really trying to learn from others that have been there. 
because they can tell you very straightforward what they what they loved, what what their regrets are, what they could have done differently, and that gives you some information about who you might be in like 15, 20 years down the line. So in the case of 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 me living the state was that it's like do I how do I see myself in 10 years? I left Nestle in my mid 40s, you know, a little bit before, and say, uh, and if I stay any longer, I would be defined by me in this company because I've been there company so long. So is there anything else to discover? And is it worth the risk? And so that's that's the kind of the reflection and just projecting myself in, in 10 years after and say, okay, and if I step back and look in the past, what can I tell about myself and, and that new experience? Mm, beautiful. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, I asked this question specifically because this is a, a common human challenge, right? It's part of being human is we got to constantly evolve ourselves. We get to constantly evolve ourselves and make new decisions and take a leap of faith such that we can get to the next level of our life, of our career, of our relationships. So thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> I do want to jump into why did you pick sustainability? going back to that uh, out of the million other problems that you could be solving i guess sustainability is across everything mm -hmm. I think this is where i mean if it was not a few years ago today is even more important but sustainability is is really how you are balancing how you balancing the process of putting things out in the world for the benefits of a few and the benefits of a, of a larger group. How you take into consideration the side effect, the cultural effect, the interdependencies of things you put out, what you innovate in a very holistic way instead of just on the field where you are good at and working in. So that's a model that not only is essential, for us to be able to continue to live on this planet. If companies either don't get that, they're eventually going to be irrelevant of a time because we live in an ecosystem. That's what we do uh, with the other company I have. It's, it's called Collective Future. And what we help organization is to think about future and possibilities of the future, but really from a place of what we call an ecosystem. We live in an ecosystem. Everything is connected. And sustainability is another word to actually take into consideration this ecosystem when you think about innovation. Mm. Typical business in the past has been, let me take advantage of resources that are quote unquote free and typically is nature. So let me just take it. Let me take advantage of that, extract as much value out of it, and then turn that free quote unquote free resources to monetary, right? And then in my mind, sustainable model takes all of the cost of making the goods, the, yeah. the ecosystem and everything in consideration. And such that when you do come up with a solution, it's not at the cost of something else, at the cost of community and so on and so forth. So the question that I have is, so if that's the case, then it would seem to be quote unquote more expensive to incorporate sustainable solutions into a business versus just screw everyone else. I'll just get what I need for now. Right? So how do you architect in the capitalist society, in the capitalist system? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's a good question is everything you create, when you create something, you destroy something that's when you create something, you extract resources. That's a given. So you cannot. You cannot avoid the equation, but your point, how can you reduce the impact or reduce the footprint of extracting something? And potentially, how can you re-inject whatever you extracted back into the system? That's where all the engineers and all the people working around sustainability are working on. And there are a lot of solutions there. But going back to your question about how you insert this in a capitalistic model, it's a very good question because... I don't know to which extent you're familiar with lean methods is really looking at the value chain where you produce and eliminate waste through the value chain and waste 
is really around everything in the process that we do does it actually create value in this process if not it is waste so uh, it goes to the very tiny elements like wait time is waste when you wait for uh, decisions to be made and you need to wait for the next meeting for the decision to be made that's waste because then this project sits there doing nothing motion movement of product we're trying to make sure that products don't move as move as less as possible because it's all we move it's actually requiring transport it's requiring it has an impact on your capital footprint for example so there's very different elements of ways you identify through lean methods but what what i want the reason why i'm mentioning that is because there's a key concept which is the idea of how you are connecting supply and demand in a very intelligent way and very, to a high level of connectedness and so that you only produce what you need okay and that model when that model was put in place in Toyota manufacturing a long while back, like 50, 60 years ago. This is something we've never applied in our industry, especially in the US or in Europe, where we've based all the logic of reducing costs by offshoring through offshore manufacturing. But this model, what it, what it creates is actually you, you mainly guess inventory and the whole capitalistic model, if you look like apparels, for example, is you go with the logic of overproduction. So you overproduce, all right? Let's say we're gonna produce a thousand units where actually people need a hundred and we're gonna then price a hundred at the real price, but then we have 900 to get rid of. So then we start doing sales and discount and then salvage. Sure, yeah. Yeah, and that's the whole model of capitalism similar so we it is worth actually overproducing if we can reduce a cost of production downstream or upstream so today we have a proof today with what's happening with the covid that this model is not completely turned upside down because it's creating a model of hyper dependencies between markets it's showing that this model was only one way of looking at it but if you look at sustainability and the opportunity of doing local production, which goes back to your questions about cost, it's more expensive. Yes, it is more expensive at first sight to produce locally, but actually what local production allows you to do is something which is much more tailored to the need. So you can produce at a, at a smaller scale for a specific population without wasting, without creating overproduction. So it's, higher margins, higher profitability rather than the other model. So there are ways, there are paths to do that. It's just how you switch the way you look at the economic model. Yeah, there's so many different angles I can talk about this. If you look at how do we reduce the cost, monoculture would be the easiest way to do it because economy yeah. scale, right? But as you said earlier, that also makes the system very fragile. Because if something is wrong with the, with the supply chain, the whole thing breaks. Let's say take the honeybee problem. Mm -hmm. right? So if the honeybee goes, the whole thing collapse. Yeah. So having more localized version of it, essentially you're enriching diversity in the ecosystem, essentially. So you don't have mono, you have diversity of the different players, smaller players, which is good for the ecosystem overall. Yeah. However, where I have challenges about is you, it, the price of the individual local system is going to go up compared you at the same time, you also have a lower cost, uh, uh, food item. So now you're essentially not you, but now the consumer is presented with an option, a $3 bottle of honey yeah. let's say, to a one bottle, sorry, $1 uh, bottle of honey. Most consumers, myself included, are just paid like, okay, so honey's makes no difference for me. Let me pay the dollar, save the two. Does that make sense? So you're going yeah. against that. How, how do you then raise the awareness or change the purchasing behavior? Even though I know this is the right thing to do, I still buy the dollar honey. You know what I mean? Yeah. Personally. No, absolutely. I, I, I totally agree. And I'm, I'm the same situation. Yeah. Why should I spend $9 for a 
for this honey versus right, this right. one with exactly. 150. Yeah, that's nine times more expensive. Yeah, that's, exactly. Uh, that's yeah. Really good. And so, first of all, I would say as a major disclaimer, it's a very vast and complex problem because mm -hmm. there's so many things that are dependent. There are, we are, for example, if you look at the US, it is an industry that has been highly dependent on conglomerates around corn production. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's incentives and there's systems in place to actually mm -hmm. keep the price of meat down. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of de economic dependencies that are you know, created by different forms of lobbying. Uh, there's and lobbying for reasons of how this system was supposed to work, but is is based on one key element, which is really hard when it comes back to because it goes back to consumer behavior. Mm -hmm. It is going with the logic of abundance. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the difference between when you were in France, for example, and here there's an expectation of abundance on everything. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how you define customer satisfaction. I can have everything I want whenever I want in the largest quantity for the lowest price. And right. and food shouldn't be treated that way. Mm, okay. Interesting. There's a lot of product that shouldn't be treated that way in, in general. But if you look at what your body needs, we are overly consuming protein meats, which is you know the highest, mm -hmm. uh, the most costly protein you can buy. Mm -hmm. But we expect abundance of that. We expect eating half, eating a pound of meat like every day, a steak on the table. So reversing the idea and saying, okay, actually I'm going to eat red meat maybe once a week, but I'm going to eat something that is pasture raised, that has good quality that's actually good for my body and good for the planet mm -hmm. it takes a whole different logic because then if you eat only one piece of meat a week and you divide this by how many times you buy the same piece of meat this is the economy adjusts itself that's just one aspect i'm not saying we're going to solve everything because mm -hmm. definitely it's another problem is how we create you know food that is affordable uh, for everyone and that's a mix of this a mix of regionizations of agriculture you can do this with having techniques of regenerative agriculture yes there's technology involved there's a lot of technology today that we should invest in that can help grow and get better product at a lower and lower price so it's the same thing so what is the acquisition cost of a new technology and then how this technology over time helps actually reduce the, your overall cost so that's mm. another aspect when you look at uh, sustainability. We could go for hours, but the thing is, that's why it's so it, it's so complex. It's so it takes so many different actors. It takes mm. public institutions, governments, uh, private institutions, lobbyists, consumer mm. pressure to actually change something. But it is it it's hap it, it is there. I mean, we're talking about this in the U.S., but you look back in Europe. There's so many countries that are so ahead of us here on, on those topics that are mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ahead of us in terms of reducing the footprints and still you know, being able to actually provide food for all, all categories of population. Mm. As you're speaking, what comes to mind is something that a service that I wish existed but doesn't is, hey, here's my food budget. I want to have high quality stuff maybe once a week. The rest, I, for me personally, I just want food for fuel, for convenience. But at once, I want to have high quality things. And I want to take the time, the effort to think about it too much because I don't care about it personally. I just wanted to basically outsource the recipe where to get the, the resources. That's what I want. I don't know about everyone else, but that's what I want. First of all. <laughs> Okay. Uh, so we, that's the intent we fully to, to to certain extent. Prepare meals that have high quality. That's the whole idea. Then mm -hmm. learns from your taste and mm -hmm. from from your nutritional need. That's so right. That's kind of the ground. So yes, yeah, so yeah. maybe one day it'd be my consumer, my first customer. <laughs> so I, I I love how so on the consumer side, all they see is nine ninety nine. That that's then it tastes good and it's you know renewable and and it's per your personalized preference. That's all they see. But just the way you articulate the different ways how you guys are thinking about the technology side of things, I, I'm already thinking like holy shit, there's so much happening in the background in terms of waste, in terms of sourcing, in terms of price, in terms of 
inventory control, everything, and then recipes and personalization. There's so much, so much going on. Very ambitious project, my friend. Awesome. So segue that for a little bit. Segue that for a little bit to artificial intelligence and innovation. Yeah. One of the things that entrepreneurs think about artificial intelligence is such a like a throwaway line. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just use artificial intelligence to mm-hmm. automatically do things for me. But it's not because artificial intelligence could be a lot of different things, a lot of different tools. And then each engineer who is pretty savvy in this space is a hundred grand, right? <laughs> Minimally. Yes. So, oh yeah. So it's Min- it's a very expensive resource. And honestly, my understanding of it, it's also not super predictable because you're solving huge problems. You don't know the solution they come up with is going to be good enough to solve the thing that you wanted to solve. Sometimes Mm -hmm. you over-engineer it. Sometimes you under-engineer it. It's a lot of unpredictability there. So saying all of that, when you approach, when you use technology as a way to help you ramp up or solve or solutions with more sophistication. Do you do a ramp up approach? Let me start off with basic technologies like simple spreadsheet to tables to before I go to an engineer who does artificial intelligence or do you just go, I know the problem is super complicated. Let me just jump straight to hire an engineer to use artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh- Actually, that's uh, that's one of the. Um, we were last year we were doing those five days AI boot camps for engineers, so we, which is much more uh, in depth. So I was not delivering those those training. It's really uh, the CTO who really has a PhD in artificial intelligence. So there's a big hype around deep neural network, deep learning. Okay, everyone is talking about this today, and so most organizations are like, oh, we're gonna go in the field of AI, so we need to use deep learning. And, and he was always go back to a number of key questions and say, after that, you don't need that. Yes, to your point, actually, we had a few clients that, that were asking, oh, we want to implement with a client in the, in the field of hospitality management. They said, oh, we want to implement like a personal concierge at scale. And we're going to be using AI and they're going to be doing all these targeted campaigns for every guest. And so we get back to them and said, you know, we're, using, we're really using human centered design and the, the way we approach to say, okay, who's the guest? What's the client trying to solve? What is the experience they're expecting there? And then we're looking at this and say, well, are you actually collecting data? There was huge gaps of the whole process of checking in data was not even there. And so don't even think about it. I just collect data. And then the second step, we took a six months where our data scientists was actually just collecting data on the Excel files and just doing insight and say, okay, just use that. You don't need any system. And so just collect the data, do your insight and make decisions out of that. And so it took six, seven months. And after that, we said, well, you want to do campaign, just launch campaign, test campaigns. Okay, don't, you don't need AI. Just launch campaign and see whether you want to test if the guests and that they're responsive to, to your idea. And now, only now that they've collected data, they've tested the model and say, okay, maybe you can try machine learning and not even deep learning, there's, there's, there's no use of that. There's a cost of it, there's a complexity. Uh, just, you know, we, over time we can use machine learning to just optimize. So yeah, to your point, it's step by step that you that you build, you don't jump on a technology like that. The other situation where you have a validated complexity from the very beginning where a technology like uh, image recognition is needed. And then then you go with that. But even with this, we really work at a super small scale. We go super nimble, we prototype this, we test, and we see whether that model is actually solving the problem that we want. Mm. So let's do a little forward looking, right? Because I've been creeping around your social profiles and everything. And one of the things that you like to talk about is innovation and artificial intelligence. And for me, as a, as a technologist myself, PhD, biomedical engineering, work with tons of innovators, right? <clears throat> to me, technology is a multiplier. It's, it's just a tool that we use to solve yeah. a particular problem. And AI is a very sophisticated tool. And to me, an unpredictable tool, re- really. <laughs> so let's do a little forward looking, right? How, what kind of problems 
that you can already anticipate the likes of AI to solve in the clients that you will work with, the people that have taken your workshops that you have already anticipated. Oh yeah, you can solve this, 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 this type of problems. That way people who are watching this can have more concrete ideas of, oh, I didn't know AI can do this. Oh, I didn't know mm -hmm. I can do that. Oh, I didn't know I can do this. Versus just a throwaway line, artificial, artificial intelligence, a, a automatic solution to solve everything. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah, I can give you a few, let me think of a few examples. Uh, sure. where AI, a very basic thing that people, when we talk about AI, it's doing a customer segmentation. Okay, so customer segmentation in marketing and sales, uh, that's a, a very immediate benefit by using machine learning because especially on unsupervised learning, so we call it unsupervised learning where there's no clear goal, no objective. So you have data, you have an algorithm, and basically the system is gonna learn, it's gonna, it's gonna find patterns that you as a human wouldn't find. So you have an e-commerce platform, for example, using the data you, you get there and, and doing clustering, and then customer segmentation is very helpful. Oh, I didn't realize that these people most likely are doing this and like that. Okay, that's the kind of correlation. So that's one aspect of it. Another aspect of leveraging AI I can give you is, so it's doing personalization, okay, of, of recommendations. So very straightforward. Think of Spotify, okay? So that's for music, but you can do this also on your e-commerce platform. That's just understanding the behavior of your consumers and, and generating the content that he needs to see for the purpose of selling your product. That's another very immediate uh, benefit of it. Now you can extrapolate into other fields. We're in discussions about crops, okay? Using image recognition and, and to optimize crops and water usage. So that's a wonderful way of leveraging AI. It's how can I use AI to understand how those little things are burgeoning, actually how much water do they need? Where do they need water? And so over time, you can optimize your, your water usage for growing crops. That's, mm. you see, very different way of looking at it. But basically, if I were to say, that's what we do on the primer. We, we used to have this primer on site, and now we're going to be doing this online. And they're free to join, by the way. So what we do is we, we, we help people understand how to innovate with this. And there's two ways to look at it very basically, you say, uh, AI can either help you automate some of your repetitive tasks and activities or help you augment some of your decisions. When you need to take decisions in a complex environment with a lot of data, AI can help. So automation, augmentation, this is really two way to look at it. And then, and that's the reason why when you do this training is to say, we try to not go into um, industry business case, like, wow, this is all the things, all the applicability. That's not how we approach the, this training. We say, what we want to teach people is to think how to innovate first, and then whether or not AI can help achieve that. So the way you approach it is AI is an augmentation to decision-making rather than kind of like a done for you type of thing. Is that accurate? Exactly. Yeah. It's most, most people would say, okay, we need to implement AI. Let's figure out where in the organization. And we've seen that, oh, those guys have implemented this way in this condition. Let's do the same thing. Does it bring any value? Maybe. Does it help be a little bit more performant? Yes. But how do you understand within your organization some of the key processes activities that define you as a, you know, as being a strong IP in organization and how then if you identify this, how then does AI help or not be better at doing this? And so that's the way we are, we are looking at the problem you want to solve first. In my mind, AI, again, is a solution to make sense of nonsensical data or too complicated of data sets, right? In my mind, when it comes to organizational behavior, or let's say a company within a company, most of the knowledge is tacit. It's inside yeah. each other's head. It's oftentimes it's not in an order fashion in a, in, on a table or in a table somewhere or in tables somewhere in the data stream, right? So. That's in my mind, the challenge, or as uh, Elon Musk said, he built Neuralink because 
the the interface between data and the brain that's that that's the biggest gap from analog to 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 digital yeah so so with that said i know one of your passion is unlocking creativity within individuals and within organizations what are some of the ways that you have thought about to really help organizations unlock their creativities even more that makes sense big question but i'm curious to know what you think well yeah <laughs> So uh, agree. Going back to what you said about AI and and yes, when is is there absolutely? And I would actually add to what you say is that AI uh, can can really help you with a lot of nonsensical data, as you said. But humans, what they doing? They doing sense making. We good. We sense makers. No technology can do that. And that's the very specificity of humans. And that goes back to what you said about creativity. Yeah, that's a good point. When I was at Nestle, I was doing a lot of workshops and my workshops had always an element to unlock creativity. Even if we were doing strategic planning, I was trying to do a, a lot of, of that. One very simple thing you can do, and I've been so many times and every time people loved it and actually was setting the scene for the, the, the right outcome is... I can give you an example. It's like one time I were looking, there was a new brand president that came at Nestle, like appointed for this new division. And he said, okay, can you, uh, you know, help me get this thing together to understand where we're going, put a plan together, et cetera. And the thing we did at the time is I, I took them um, out of the office. So we, I took them basically, it was, so it was in the, in the space of confections and snacks. And, and I took them in doing store visits. And what we did is like, I took them to actually pizza and, pizza and coffee, the name. And then, and then I say, okay, you gonna order coffee and you actually gonna ask a questions a few customers here. And then, and then we're gonna regroup. And you had those presidents, they were all like VP level, the other ones, and they had like literally order coffee. And I said, what, what we need to do now is actually not just order the coffee you would do every day, but try to observe everything that's happening and take the consideration that nothing here is given, everything's been designed. And so they had to report back that. And what was so interesting is two things. The first one is we are, we suck in creativity because primarily first, we are bad observers. We, we just walk in a world with no awareness of what's around us. And you can do the most futile things in your life, like going in a grocery store, but just the fact that you stop at some point and just look around what is happening, how people are working around you, what do they say, how's the light, what's the music in the back, how the product are display, it creates so much more awareness of your environment. And that sparks ideas. So that's one thing. And the second thing, which is so great when you do this kind of exercise, is people, those VPs, they never get out of, of their office very, and if they go out, they go out to another part of the office or another plant, but take them in a real environment, have them observe the environment and share all together. It creates bonding. So it creates a place of trust between people and exchange. There's a lot of happening and you learn so much from the way another one is observing. Oh, I didn't see these things. How did he see that thing? And Anything, so a, Nick, any examples you can share with us where this, these group of VPs are surprised yeah, so and I, delighted about something they never seen before? Yeah. In that case, they were, the whole approach was about, we sell product. We never see the consumers because we sell product to the different supermarkets. Okay. So the, the way you, you design brands is around, is around a messaging that's going to go through advertising is around your packaging, but I stopped there. So I took them to a Nike store. When they went through this exercise, they realized how much the brand was actually reflected in the visual environment and then in the way people were actually interacting with you. So in the service, in the language, in the, in the, in the design of you know, the apparels they were wearing. And what I asked them to do is say, okay, now let's go back. And now let's imagine that this brand is actually like a Nike brand, it's a store. How would you design the store? And they had to actually do design the store and design this brand through that experience. And what would that experience be? And so that's that's one example on how 
actually, when they did Alexa, there was a clear realization that they must go much deeper in, in, in understanding what are the driving values for those, for those, the, the brand that they carry and was, and not just working on a surf, surface of packaging. And I guess the big takeaway there was like, no one is dupe of an honest message or a shallow message. message. As in French, dishonest message, like you cannot, you cannot convey an idea if pe- people will feel whether it is sincere or not. Mm. Uh, if the message of your communication is sincere or not. And if it's going to be sincere because you really thought through what the value drivers are for this brand. And mm. so that, that's, a, that's an example of. One of the things that we say a lot on this podcast is um, people often don't remember what you say or what you do, but they will remember how you make them feel. So I love the fact that you take, you took uh, these VPs to a new environment and you ask them to broaden the awareness and then observe new things happening and also internalize and communicate what they observe. So in my mind, this is a very holistic transformational experience that you share with them. So it's not only insightful, but also it shift, it shift the way they, how they look at it. And you also ask them to create a new experience based yeah. on the new data that they have. So now all of a sudden, it's not just insights, intellectual insights, but it's actually embodied practice. They, Completely. They something new. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And, and yeah, I love what you're saying here. It's exactly that. That's a, I always say that we spend our time in meetings, but we, if you were to visualize the meeting, we're just putting brains around the table. So like little brains. That's why we're asking to bring on the table, but you need to bring the body with it. Okay. There's so much more that it has to be connected with the, the embodiment of an experience. That's part mm-hmm. of what is so needed for unlocking creativity. And we tend to just keep those two things separated. And that's the reason why also, I guess I told you we're doing in those uh, last year in those boot camps, we were working with this actor, storyteller, doing improv classes with engineers. Oh, nice. That's great. And, and where they get, they get there, this five days intense boot camp, they're learning everything about AI. It's so intense. They're like 10 hours every day. But during these 10 hours, we have an actor with us. And actually what's funny is that the actor is actually doing the, the, the AI review and he's basically say, I'm an actor, I have no engineering background, you guys, but I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna explain you to you what is AI, okay? And the, the reason I'm doing this is because you need to explain to somebody that is not in your field, what is AI? Mm-hmm. But then he's doing all this improv exercise. And the reason why we did this improv exercise is because we wanted to teach them presentation skills, connecting mm-hmm. with people in a mm-hmm. way that they can pass a message. And so instead of putting a PowerPoint, you say, let's bring people that works day in day out with creating empathy. Mm-hmm. And so he, was, so he built those improv exercises throughout these five days. And after five days, A, they enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. B, they like there was so much bond and it was creating a real relationship of trust between everyone. Because when you go all those silly exercises of improv, you need to let go of all your uh, inhibitions and, and trust that others will not judge you. Mm-hmm. And then through that, they learn storytelling and building on ideas of others. And and that's 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 a good example that I wanted to share with you about how you embody an experience, a learning experience in a way. For me, that is much more, stay much more longer than just talking to the brain. Yeah, I don't know if you can tell I'm a huge uh, fan of accelerated. What I was going to say is that accelerated learning comes from, in my mind, not just cerebral understanding of things, but how do you rapidly intake, but also teach and present it quickly as uh, the more iteration that you do, the better that you'll be able to really internalize the knowledge that you've learned. Mm -hmm. So I love that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, but innovation workshop five day, that's a one-time thing, right? How do you help organization to sustain this inspiration throughout to really catalyze a culture of innovation rather than a one-time inspiring experience. Yeah. Yeah. So I've worked on 
large business technology transformation. When I was at NSA, I did one that was across the U.S. So the U LA was the headquarters, but we had like 25,000 employees across the U.S. And we're shifting strategy, adopting new ways of working, etc. And I was in charge of that. And, uh, and I tend to tell you I had like good success and, 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 and good failures too. Because I was implementing things by the book. And in some places, I could see results. In other places, it was just not sticking up. The few, basically, if you look at the way people adopt things, um, you can have the greatest CEO that can, you know, do amazing town halls and, and do the pep talk and people are behind and they create a sense of urgency. But as soon as there's so much you can do uh, uh, like that from a CEO and ask from a CEO. At some point in time, things has to go back to businesses where the things start being, start seeing the reality of who's adopting, who's not adopting that, who's pushing back or not. One thing that I've learned and I've seen been a success and I've been using this extensively and that's what we're doing a lot with Collective Future today, which is, we, we call this creating base camps, uh, the idea of creating base, camp, base, base camps. Base camps. Mm -hmm. And it goes with the idea of what you said about how do you embed creativity and organization goes with how much agency you give to people to actually feel that they own the stories of this change they implement the organization and that they have permission for being creative and coming with new ways of, of, of solving problems. So the idea of Basecamp in, in a nest I call that lighthouses is you, you create within an office the environment, the existing environment in different places, you create you create a place, a physical place that embodies the changes, the values that you want to bring. Mm. So if it's creativity, if it's adopting design thinking, for example. Mm. So it's a it's a physical environment where mm. when you move into that environment, you are actually in the manifestation of of this new place that the organization needs mm. to be at some point in time. And so you use this place for training, you use this place for coaching, you use this place for making rituals of celebration, of celebration, recognizing the work of people. Mm -hmm. This is where you bring other VP from other area to go see the success of this and interact with the people that are engaged with these new forms of innovation or this new project. And this is then, once you have that in place, you actually, the people that are working in this, in this, in the, on this change, you empower them to actually run this, this place, this lighthouse or this base camp. So they become like the evangelist uh, and the influencer of this big place. And they bring organically other and they rally other people to these new ways of working or thinking. And once you have that, then you replicate the same model across organizations. So you create those little lighthouses everywhere. Mm -hmm. And over time, then this is where you shift the rest of the organization. And that's almost true like peer pressure about those lighthouse, but mm -hmm. that's a way of, of embedding change uh, in the most successful, in my opinion, that's where mm -hmm. it proved to be the most successful. So I like that. I can't remember some stage philosopher said our environment is greater than our willpower. So essentially what you said, creating these lighthouses, these environment dedicated for innovative thinking as an embodiment, as a, as a manifestation of this ethos of innovation. Love exactly. that. Exactly. Anything specific around the rituals? So you had said CEOs making a town hall, that's a ritual, right? Any other rituals that serves, that you've seen, that you have tested, that you've experimented, that serves as a way to really reinforce this innovative ethos? Yeah. Uh, so there's the ritual of how you get this group together and run those meetings. So typically we're doing a 15 minute stand up meeting in this space. So people go there in the morning and they just talk about the top priorities that they have. We had an action board and on the board, uh, we could visualize some of the problems and who was assigned to, but there was no problem solving. So just, just aligning and then five minutes talking about moods of everyone, like anything we're doing like smiley faces. There was also this, when people get in a room with like a whiteboard and people could just put the, the face and we could see globally if the face was like smiley or neutral or, or like this. So it gives a sense as a team, where's the mood? So that's another like a small ritual. And we had like recognitions for every time somebody was solving a problem. 
So one in the team would actually recognize this every time there was a meeting, we had a weekly meeting or so. So every time there's this weekly meeting, we do a recognition. And one would say, oh, I want to recognize CK for having solved this problem and having done that or etc." So recognition was an, uh, an important part of rituals. Mm. Mm. Love that. But to your question, I guess, it goes back to creativity is you need to, every team was creating their own rituals. And that's where, I guess, when you start getting too rigid and say, okay, as an organization, this is the rituals you need to adopt. And I've seen this in application mm. where mm. we're a little bit too rigid and say, oh, this is the rituals you need to go. So you need to go to recognition, to this and that. Mm-hmm. If the great recognition is, is done, but then the heart is not here, then mm-hmm. it feels superficial, it feels uh, constrained, and you actually create the, the, a counter effect. So right. it's about defining the rituals from what the team is about, and having this team to come with their own rituals is very important. That's something yeah. I've learned. Yeah. And coaching the leader to be actually the enabler of those rituals because that's a very difficult thing and not the the leader to be actually the giver of the of the rituals yeah so i used to be in charge of culture in a startup that went from small team to 200 people we went from an idea to hundreds of millions of dollars in in valuation right so it's an interesting question that we grapple with right do we built it like a architect, like here's a blueprint, here's the framework, here's the drywall, here's the painting. You just do it side by side that way. Or do we build it like a garden, like an ecosystem? We help have some frameworks, but things will happen organically. And it's a challenge good because if you don't have a structure, then you, it's very easy to lose it. Right, yeah. whatever magic, it's it's hard to reinforce it. But if you do it too structured, then it's artificial and it's not authentic. Yeah. So there's a fine line somewhere. Don't quite have a, an answer per se, but the way I would invite all of my audience members to really th- think about is from my personal lesson, it's less about it being an architect. It's more about uh, cultivating, being a gardener and then cultivating a, a rich, diverse ecosystem. Would you absolutely. agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I can totally agree with what you're saying. And the, the, the difficult tension between having a structure but not being too prescriptive in what you're doing. But actually, there's, there's one element that we tend to underestimate or, or not even see is that, to your point, you need, you need the garden and you need the gardeners. So in your garden, it's, you can create the, the, a beautiful garden Okay, with a lot of potential to be used. But who the leader is going to be in this organization, this garden, is so important. So spending the time with coaching and leadership development in the right way is so important because they are the one enabling this garden uh, to flourish. And if they're not, and it's a losing battle. And I've seen this many times. So it's understanding how to coach and train and grow those leaders, but also very quickly understanding when those leaders actually would not be the right gardener from the very beginning. And usually people have a good sense. If, uh, if you really understand the types of, of leadership and management, who you should put or not put in these gardens. Okay. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about sort of the selection criteria in your mind to choose the right leaders for these type of lighthouses or type of things? Well, you cannot have a leader that is micromanaging. All those things can be, you can risk, not reskill, but you can help this leader see how their management style is affecting their environment. But the difficulty you will see the ones that is hopeless. It's when they have strong confirmation that their leadership produce the results and say, why should I change the way I'm be- I behave as a leader? Because until today, I've always proved to be right and I've delivered my results. It's very, very difficult. So you need to find usually leaders that already have collectively shared the, the success of a project 
and they're not branding this under themselves, you have like usually more hope to see people changing the mindset, being more open to new ways uh, of working, adopting new leadership skills. And that's what I've, I've, I've seen. So if I'm hearing you right, someone with a growth oriented mindset, someone who's open to new ideas and also allow others to share the idea in a psychological safe space. Yeah. yeah. And that doesn't mean that those that don't have that will not succeed. And it is very important to create conditions for people to see uh, new possibilities. So that's why we're doing those workshops. Like it's a half day for all the leaders. We're going through that. And then we're going to a physical exercise of a method. And then through that, they will understand the value. But if after this, things don't change, then you, you kind of know how difficult it's going to be for you to uh, shift their, their mindset. Yeah. So I want to actually um, ask some forward looking questions, if you don't mind. Sure. In a time like right now, right, where everything is challenged from the smallest level and health to the familial level, like you're both stuck at home to handling your kids, to handling your own uh, childcare, to companies, the economic system is being disrupted to city, state, nation, in an international, like this whole pandemic imp impacts from the small scale all the way out to the grandest, the largest scale, right? Because you and I, we met from a uh, COVID crush syndicate collaboration coming together as a way to really help come up with new solutions to this. So I'm curious to know your point of view as an innovation expert, how do we scale that kind of effort and how do we improve upon this kind of effort to accelerate more innovations to come to address a global scale level problem? Well, yeah, uh, but first of all, thank you, CK, for having put together this COVID crash syndicate. This is awesome. What is awesome is, is you have people from very different horizons. And it's exactly go back to you know, unlocking creativity, how you bring very different perspectives, point of views, cultures, but also practices all together to, to try and solve problems. That's the first step. Right? So that's 100% right uh, what you did. Now, if you look at the different groups that we've been working at, the work, the group are naturally on food waste right now. And this is a very good question because how, how do you do something where you don't create additional silos? And how do you actually leverage on what others on the ground are already doing so you can have a large impact? And it's absolutely the key question is how are we doing? So in the, in the case of the food waste, how we connect farmers that have excess productions and harvest and how do we have food banks, shelters, hospitals, all these nonprofit organizations that are actually in demand for fresh foods for you know people and families today, how to connect that. And that's what we're doing is like you, we're focusing on one specific region but we're looking at this from a place of a, a, a system. So we put a system, a platform, and we say, how can we bring technology processes and the right actors to do this connection? And we learn from that, we formalize this, we standardize uh, those learnings very quickly. And then this model can be then replicated in another city, another city, another city. I think this is how you, you can scale. It's not necessarily scale as a nationwide, but how you do this at the prototype level for one specific region, you, you gather the learnings and then you open source it to another actor to do the same because you need people like in Seattle, like in any city that has the understanding of the ground, of, of the layout. So we're in LA, so this is natural we're doing this here, but then you put the platform at disposals and the processes and then you ask, actors that know um, their field and do the same. Th this is how I think uh, we can scale and have an impact today. Let me do a quick recap. So what I hear you say is, let me solve this local problem with the specific players in mind, but at the same time, look at it from a operating system, systematic point of view, right? And then solve it. And then, then you open source that to other places such that other cities or states can say, 
this, let me see how I can develop my local solutions for our region specifically. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. So the follow-up question would be, have you seen a effective open source solutions that follow similar type of model? And I asked this question could be in my mind, open source is an interesting innovation, shall we say, because it goes sort of against the self-interested egoic mind model. Does that make sense? So, so hence why I, I haven't actually yeah. quite seen a lot of different solutions that work on a systematic level. So I'd love to hear if yeah. you have seen effective open source type solutions. Well, that's a good point. We actually, for the, for the food platform, we, we're looking at an existing platform because it's called Open Food Network. It's a nonprofit organization and they've been developing a platform exchange between farmers and, and farmers market, basically. Uh, it's open source, it's, it's been crowd developed, you know, some GitHub. So there's all developers from Australia, France, Canada, everywhere is contributing to that platform. Um, so that's the open source on the technical aspect of it. So to your, your question, I haven't seen an example of what we're doing now, but again, it's very, it's very early days. We, we started a week ago this challenge. So we are going live next week uh, already. So we're going very, very quickly. We have to move very quickly because the promise of uh, food waste is, is really happening now. But from the things we've seen, we haven't seen a model, but I guess it, there must be some sort of model. But I guess to your question, even if you have the platform which is open source, what makes the difference is what is what do you design this for? And so what is the purpose, how you design it? And what is the process that you put in place that make it very unique, okay? And so that's what we're trying to get. And what we're trying to get is how to, can we put the most minimal structure in place, remove any intermediaries or any people in this, in this process to allow farmers and those food banks and the last mile volunteers to connect together on this platform and like, you know, an exchange platform. So that's what is unique. This hasn't been designed this way, but the architecture allows it to happen. So it's mm -hmm. what you design on top of it that makes it uh, different or unique. Yeah, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Have you talked to Cameron about his Architect for Humanity platform that he built a little while ago? I mean, all, all of you guys are just creative genius of your own, in your own right, where you're just constantly coming up with new ideas, new projects. The reason I mentioned him specifically because he built a open source type innovation platform to allow architects, individual architects to upload their own design to help local solutions or local tribesmen in remote areas, right? Every tribe have different needs. So my friend, I want to be super respectful of your time. We talked a lot about different things, right? We talked about <clears throat> your favorite dish. We talked about <laughs> teaching me the atomic unit of tasting food to broaden it up to um, having an emotional relationship with food to collaborating sustainable food. How you design your workshops is a transformative experience for the people who want to learn about artificial intelligence. What else did we talk about? We talked about your passion for sustainable food and project, this platform that you're building, right? What else did we talk about? Unlocking creativity, the embodiment right. of experience. That's right. We talked about how do I actually do that on a, an individual level, as well as on the systemic level, right? The lighthouses within the different organizations and then picking the right people with the right mindset to do that. So a wide range or wide spectrum around innovation, artificial intelligence, food. What's one thing if they can walk away with and act upon your recommendation that you ask them to do from this conversation. So with what is happening right now, where we are moving, navigating in terms of complete uncertainties. And if you're working in a business, there's one thing I would say is it's the time to surround yourself with people that have diverse backgrounds like completely different from your business. Get them together and try an exercise to ask, to try to identify the questions to ask about this business. That would be for me the most 
effective, interesting way um, to start for navigating the unknown because you need very different new perspective because everything is now different. Hmm. Let me add on top of what you just said. In these type of conversations, one of the topics I love to ask the people in the group is called DOS, danger, opportunity, and strength. And why we want to talk about it because other people may be able to see the danger that you don't see, the opportunities that you don't see, or the strength that you have that you may not see. So having yeah. a conversation around this would be for uh, a mutually productive conversation. So with that said, my friend, people who are inspired by your story, by the way you think, by the way you articulate, by the passion that you have, by your French background, where should they find you and follow you? They can find me on LinkedIn and, and they can message me. I love responding. I'm there. So that's the easiest way uh, to connect with me. Thank you, my friend, for opening your heart, opening your mind, opening this uh, very wide range of conversations that we have today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, CK, for having me. It was a very humbling experience. <laughs>